Hey, all you crazy folks. Welcome back to another episode. This time we are filming, recording, listening from beyond the grave because I sound like death warmed over. I promise I feel better than I sound. But uh, let Doc's relentless, merciless uh, mockery begin for this episode. So, so we'll get this show on a run. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. The podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. Without further ado, we're going to let our guest, Mr. Will McCarthy, introduce himself. Uh, hi, my name is Will McCarthy, and I am a science fiction writer. Um, and uh, people sometimes ask me for my biography, and it's kind of all over the place. I've lived life on the a la carte plan. I've been a, an engineer. I've been a journalist. I've been an entrepreneur. Um, I've uh, uh, done done a lot of different things. So I'll just say that. But he is not, he wants you to know, a musician in Ireland. Not him. Okay, JR. There's another one, McCarthy, who spells his name with two L's instead of one. Who's what I found initially when I was getting him ready for this episode. Who's that explains some of the weird questions you were asking me. Yeah, I mean, it's cool. We like Irish, yeah. too. If you got any Irish authors, you know, they can come on the show. So, but he, he and I get confused. I mean, you're younger than him, totally. Um, so this is the part of the introduction, dear listener, before things get any more awkward, where we tell you how we first found them. So we actually found Will uh, through Doc. She knows people who know people and made this happen. So Doc, how did you first meet the one, the only, Mr. Will McCarthy? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Old age is a bitch, isn't it? This is because I was making fun of you about your wonderful voice, or lack thereof, isn't it? It is. <sighs> Normally, uh, the, a lady in her age is like the third rail. You just don't touch it. But, you know, I decided to go there today. I might well, regret yeah, tomorrow. Well, you death, so. If you don't hear from me tomorrow, people, please send help. And we know Doc did it. I did not do it. My minions did. <laughs> All right, Doc. So you don't remember how you first met him. That means we get to jump right to the religion questions. He could always tell. You could ask him. Or you could. You could be mannerable, you know. Use your manners and stuff. Mannerable. Is that even a word? No, it's not. It is now. Merriam-Webster, please get on that. I think I think the science fiction community at the end of the day is a is a fairly small community. Uh, we're, we're all like two degrees of separation apart. See? That was much nicer. I, I just generically assume when Doc says she knows people, they met at one bar or of a con, one con or another. I know you. You don't go to cons. Because I'm allergic to people. And, you know, you are a bar, so there's that. I don't drink that much anymore, Doc. That'd be nice. I know. But right now it's just fun. So on, on to the religion question. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly, if you had to pick one. If I had to pick one, um, well, Firefly, you exhaust in only uh, 12 episodes. So if we're, if we're going based on the, the uh, entertainment uh, per, per dollar expended, I can, I can rent Disney Plus and watch Star Wars for an entire month. I can watch Star Trek for maybe three weeks. Uh, this is nonstop, mind you. Whereas Firefly, oh, I would watch way more Star Trek than a, three weeks. If I if I if I did nothing else, uh, anyway, I'm going to go with Star Wars. <laughs> Fair. Star Wars is a good one. It combines both the wonderful sci-fi and some amazing fantasy tropes. But speaking of fantasy, how about Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or the Wheel of Time? Definitely not Wheel of Time. Um, uh, I almost thought probably, you were when you were talking about bang for your buck on a series because I mean it is long. It is long, yes, uh, but there has to be some some uh, some bang there. Uh, I, I'm not a not a Wheel of Time fan. 
uh, Game of Thrones or or uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, that's a toss up. I, I I couldn't pick. Well, is there one that you would pick that you like better? Well, how about this? My my wife doesn't like Lord of the Rings, but she does like Game of Thrones. So uh, there will be peace in my household if I if I choose the latter. Well, there you go. They say happy wife, happy life. So, um, so, you know, we love both sci-fi and fantasy here, but which was your first love sci-fi or fantasy? Oh, uh, definitely science fiction. Yeah. Uh, I, I started with, with HG Wells, uh, and kind of never, never left it. Uh, I do enjoy fantasy. I, I enjoy sort of the best of of fantasy, uh, but uh, more as a more as an aperitif uh, rather than a than a main course. So, what was your first memory engaging in sci-fi? Then, was it the mm. Star Wars franchise or H.G. Wells? Yeah, I'm I'm much too old for Star Wars to have been my first engagement point with science fiction. I'm sorry to say, uh, <laughs> the first Star Wars movie came out in 1977, and I was uh, 11 at the time. So I know somebody uh, who would say you are one of the most trustworthy. He, I have a friend who used to argue that if they were alive for the very first Star Wars movie, that they were the most trustworthy of generations. And I'm like, I'm not sure that works, but. He was oh, okay. adamant. I would say my first engagement point was Star Trek. Um, uh, if we're talking about actual science fiction, I mean, I I, I remember the, the first moon landing. I was three at the time, uh, but my father said, remember this. And, and so I did. Uh, but equally important to me as, as the moon landing, which I was allowed to watch, was Star Trek, which I was not allowed to watch. But I liked to, to sneak uh, some some viewings of it here and there. Uh, so I know that from the age of three, I was I was a would be avid viewer of Star Trek. That is awesome, and good of you to remember from three and actually like pay attention to what your dad said. Do you actually remember it, or you just remember because you've been told about it enough? No, I remember it. I remember what the room looked like and everything. Cool. Now that's a pretty amazing moment. I think anybody who watched it would have it engraved on their psyche. That's fair. I've never been so young when something as momentous happened. So I would be curious to see, like, for instance, someone who was that age when 9-11 happened, if they remember that as they get older, that kind of thing. Uh, there have been psychological studies that show that there is a lingering effect from even children who are younger than that. Interesting. All right, but we don't want to get all Debbie Downer here. So. No, not after such a wonderful thing. I got to wonder, though, did your parents maybe know you were doing it? Because my child has snuck sci-fi shows, and I've known that he was watching them, but I was like, I, I, I'm tired, and this is good for him to watch, and let him think he's pulling one over on mom. I don't know. My father fancied himself a connoisseur of pop culture. I was not allowed to watch Star Trek. I was not allowed to read comic books. But I was allowed to read as many real books as I wanted. And that's how I ended up reading H.G. Wells, I think. Okay. So. Works for me. So what is it you love about the larger umbrella that is speculative fiction? Well, I do like the largeness of it. Uh, I mean, it, it can encompass literally any type of story. Uh, you know, some people, when they're trying to be wise asses, say that that uh, literary uh, fiction is a is a branch of hard science fiction, and in a way, it's true. Uh, but uh, you can kind of do anything in speculative fiction. You can tell any kind of story, and you can set it any kind of place. My particular niche is in uh, early and hard science fiction. Uh, that's what. I do well, that's where I'm comfortable and that's where people uh, often look for me to, to go. Uh, but, um, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy all kinds of speculative fiction. I like ghost stories. I like, I like all kinds of stuff. Um, ironically, 
as a reader um, to to keep to keep going uh, with a with a hard science fiction career requires a voracious appetite of reading science nonfiction. Uh, so most of what I read is not fiction, but uh, so uh, how hard science when you're doing the reading do you do? Do you read like the peer reviewed articles or the the more reader friendly articles? Peer reviewed articles are not reader friendly. <laughs> typically. Well, I think it depends on how interested I am in the subject. Okay. Um, I will. Uh, constantly on a daily basis, I'll peruse my my favorite uh, science uh, topics. You know, Flipboard. I've got a Flipboard science channel that that is constantly serving me content, and I've got a subscription to Science News, which I read voraciously. Uh, and so that keeps me apprised of what the what the developments are. If there's something that I'm interested in, then yes, I will look up look up the peer reviewed. Uh, papers and and read them. Honestly, it's in it's in those. Uh, they're not exactly reader friendly, especially if they're in quantum mechanics or what have you. But that's where you get the really juicy details that other writers don't have access to. I mean, they have access; they're just not actually doing it. Taking the time um, for it, yes. right? And that verisimilitude. I mean, just as a as an example, when I was writing my latest uh, novel, Rich Man's Sky. Uh, I wanted to know what types of plants would grow well in lunar soil. Um, and, it, you know, there's there's peer reviewed science on that. There aren't very many. There's a short list of plants that can be grown all the way from a seed to the point where they generate another seed that can be planted and will also grow. Um, lunar soil is very uh, nutrient poor. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's not easy to find plants that are that are kind of capable of eking out an existence there. But uh, uh, by re reading those peer-reviewed uh, journal articles, you can find out not only what the plants are, but what the uh, different factors are in growing them and how long it takes and uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, that those those details really pop um, for, for readers, I find. Fair. Um, you can also get a lot of details if you're not as scientifically literate, just reading the white papers, which are just the summaries. Those are tend to be a lot more reader friendly in the in the verbiage. True. And, you know, you can oftentimes the, the papers are behind a paywall, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, then you have to go to the library to get access to them. But um, uh, you you uh, can still read the abstract. Sometimes you can, um, if you, if you, so you have a lot of access to that when you're in college with like J stores and all the programs, uh, dear listener, if you're actually interested, sometimes if you've got a college near you, they'll let you like purchase a, a membership. that's not that expensive every year to their library. So you can use their academic, um, sources like a regular student can. Um, but so how did your love of science fiction transition into you writing stories in that space? Like how did that shift happen for you? You know, I I think I always uh, uh, I always wrote, and I always knew that I wanted to write. Uh, I can't remember what the first thing I wrote is, but I remember that I wrote a series of books when I was in first grade in crayon on that crappy yellow paper that that we had back then. Um, that were Sam Survivor, the the Chronicles of Sam Survivor. Uh, so I know that, that, uh, I've been at it a long time. Um, I started writing with serious intents with intents to, to get published when I was 16. Uh, and I did get published when I was 20 or 21, I think. Um, but you know, people these days ask me, how did I break in? And I'm like, I, I don't know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Okay. So many authors let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments that shape you as a storyteller, you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, we all, we all have uh, formative, formative experiences. Um, I mean, I've, uh, I've been a, a son and a husband and a father. 
uh, and and those are very important, uh, you know. And I've been an employee. I've been an employer. Uh, I've been uh, a uh, a person grubbing for investor dollars, and I've been an investor. I've been a a scientist and an engineer. Uh, I've been a science journalist, uh, and and all of these things, uh, you know, make it easier to draw on to to imagine characters in, in different situations. Uh, so, yeah, I think that those all, uh, those all matter a lot. Okay. Um, so a little bit of behind the scenes here, dear listeners. So normally there are some of the questions that if you notice don't get asked every episode, that's because we prep in advance. And if the answer is no on those specific questions, it's dead air time. So we cancel them. So as part of that prep, I asked him about the military service because we normally ask those questions. And Will's answer was not quite a direct yes, but was a fun uh, answer. So what is your experience in and around the military? Well, in addition to having a lot of uh, a lot of friends uh, who've, who've been in the military, uh, uh, I personally have not served, but I went to high school uh, at the Air Force Academy. I went to junior high and high school there. At the time, uh, it was the only school around for, for miles. So anyone who lived uh, within uh, busing distance uh, of the Air Force Academy, and busing distances at that time were, were a lot longer, I think, than they are now. Um, but uh, uh, everybody got bussed onto the the Air Force Academy to to go to high school, so that that certainly uh, changes your perspective on things a little bit. That would be really interesting, and I, I'd love to talk to you about it more. Because my senior year, I went to a boarding school that was all, located on a college campus. Uh huh. So probably it, a very. It was. Probably it was a really different experience because did you get to take classes at that level with the Air Force students? No, no, it okay. was a separate separate building. Um, but uh, you know, it was kind of all around. Did you get to use any of their facilities because you were there, like the gym or something? No, we had our own. We had our oh, own yeah. facilities. They were pretty good. I mean, oh, you yeah. know, it was a it was a pretty well-equipped facility. They like to trick uh, ROTC kids into, and uh, academy kids into thinking that the Army, that Big Sam get, cares about them. So, you know. Okay. And on that happy note. <laughs> Somebody's really um, going to wonder what I think about one day. So do you think that that experience and being watching the cadets, or I guess our Air Force, are Zoomies cadets stock, do you know? Or they they're cadets. They okay. are cadets. Yes. Uh, so, was your time around the cadets? Do you feel like that affects the way you tell stories, or do you think it's more influenced by your military friends post high school? Oh, I don't know. Uh, and reading and TV. I mean, we we uh, in in the U.S. we all get get uh, kind of steeped in military culture in a lot of different ways. So I don't know that. Uh, uh, necessarily, my impressions of the military are, are are particularly drawn from my high school experience. I, I was going down that line of thinking because I mean, you know, not all readers check, but obviously, dear listener, this was published by Bain, uh, and they have a reputation for going above and beyond for being military friendly. They donate hundreds of tons of books to Thank deployed you. veterans, and they send care packages and stuff. So. Um, I just was curious uh, how that, you know, because if you made the cut with them, they they tend to think there's something that's pretty that fits that audience. So well, I thought Bain's it was worth pursuing. Really solid in their world building, and they really require their authors to be solid in their world building. So and consistent, and and a Bain. Not a lot of people realize this, but Jim Bain was a vet, so he like and Tony would never let something fly that didn't really meet with plausibility of being military culture. So. Sure. If, if you're going to write for analog, you better have your science right. And if you're going to write for Bain, you better have your, your military stuff right. So. All right, Doc. Are you ready for your favoritest questions, the ones you added to the document when we started this shenanigans? 
the uh, fandom questions. Yes, I am. How can you wonder if I am? I mean, this is I me. don't know. Do you ever get tired of fandom? You're like, man, I just want to nap. Fandom can wait. That's what I did this past weekend. I took a long, long nap after going to a brewery. Well, was that a nap or did you just pass out? It was a nap because I didn't snore. Okay. All right. All right. Let's make it about <laughs> Will again. Not okay. your alcohol problem. Transitioning <laughs> into the fandom stuff. Have you had any cool art or a cosplay of one of your characters yet? Uh, not cosplay, but yes, I've had some cool fan art. Uh, uh, the, my very first novel was called Aggressor 6, and it had these... these uh, cool aliens in it. Um, and several people sent me pictures of the aliens that as it, as it appeared in their mind. And that was, that was kind of neat. Uh, and then for did my, the, did the drawings match with how you pictured them? Yeah. Yes. Really? And no. That means you, that means that you did a, I mean, there's always subject to an interpretation, but that means that you actually described what you saw in your head very well, which is a hard skill. Yes. Well, the the other the other book that I got fan art for is my my uh, most popular by far book, which which was called the Collapsium, um, and I got I got several pieces of fan art for that, and it was neat. It's very flattering when people do that, even if it only takes them. I mean, people with their digital art stuff, you know, they can probably whip something out in in an hour or two, but still, that's an hour or two they spent on on something that I wrote and they're not getting paid for it. They're just doing it because it's fun. So that's, I like that. That is wonderful. And the passion that fans pour into um, homage artwork like that is always so amazing. Um, so has anyone asked you for your autograph yet in public? Uh, I mean, I can... But you would never get one of those. At at uh, at conventions, obviously, people ask me for my autograph. Um, we have an independent bookstore here in uh, uh, in Colorado called the Tattered Cover, and a couple of times I was recognized and asked to sign books there. Um, probably the the and it, I, I've had the experience more than once of being at a party and and seeing one of my books on the shelf um, from and the host not even knowing that I wrote that book. Uh, Did you so pick it up and sign it as a funny? Because I totally would do that. No, no, I'm an attention hog. I, I said, you know, I, I wrote that book. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's just fun to see people's reaction when they they connect the, 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 the Will McCarthy they know, they know with this book that they read uh, in in the past. Um, so, uh uh, and the other the other experience that I thought was really neat um, when my daughter was was uh, about eight or so, I took her to the library and we were waiting in line to check out books. And she pointed to a book up on the returns shelf and she said, Dad, isn't that your book? And uh, I said, yes, it is. And there were a lot of people waiting in line and they all kind of turned and looked. And I thought, well, that's fame if you get recognized in the in the library <laughs> that's awesome and it's so sweet that she recognized it i'm pretty sure my son would not recognize anything i did so you have a good child there um so you've spotted people with your books but can you give us like a i don't know you kind of already gave us a funny hand jr saved me for myself tonight i'm sorry <laughs> My brain no. is still on vacation. Yeah. It does that when you drink that much vodka. But I did not and, drink vodka. Yeah. I am not that. I don't have any Russian in me. I did not drink vodka. <laughs> Scotch so, whiskey cider. Um, but can you give us the highlight reel of what you've covered? So and save me from myself, please, Will. I'm not sure what you're asking me. Uh, I'm so sorry. what all have you written? What all have oh. you written? I, I see. Yes. Um, well, uh, uh, Rich Man's Sky is, I believe, my 13th book. Um, I have the the uh, pleasure at this point of not being entirely sure, because every time I count out the books that I've written, I get a different answer. And this is even if I'm looking at the at the brag shelf behind me here, 
I can count them out there and it's sometimes it's 11 and sometimes it's 14 and I just, I've given up. Um, but uh, uh, one of those books was an anthology that I edited. Uh, one of them was a nonfiction book um, that I wrote that ended up uh, changing my life. Uh, and, and the rest of them are all, are all science fiction. I'll talk briefly about the book that changed my life. Um, when I wrote The Collapsium, I wanted to have a um, technology that would kind of take the place of magic. I wanted to tell something that had the structure of a fairy tale, but was identifiably a hard science fiction story. So I came up I mean, with this I, idea. I always have a soft spot in my heart for those kind of sci-fi stories. As do I. Um, so I came up with this idea of programmable matter, which at, at the time was was a, a novel idea. And um, uh, I got some cranky uh, fan mail saying, well, this is, this is not a hard science idea. This is clearly fantasy. I don't know why you stuck it in this book. And the fact was I had done a lot of homework. I had, I had kind of rigorously studied the, the subject. And so I wrote a couple of nonfiction articles um, on the subject. And then my articles got more and more detailed. And then I sold a really long article to Wired uh, on the subject, which ended up with me getting hired at Wired and being an editor there for several years. But um, by the time I actually wrote the Wired article, I had so much material left over, I said, I, I could write a book. I, I mean, I could just assemble a book um, in, in just a couple of months. Uh, so I did that and it got published by Basic Books, which is a, a publisher of, of uh, popular science books. But then a few months later, uh, I got a call from one of the inventors of the Blackberry, which sounds very quaint now. You remember the Blackberry? Uh, I, do. I do remember the Blackberry. At the time, the Blackberry was the thing that everybody was using. So, so the inventor of the BlackBerry is sort of like the inventor of the iPhone. Uh, this was, this this was the the time that this this was happening. Um, anyway, he he called me up and he said, you know, I really enjoyed that book. I also read the Collapsium. I enjoyed the the fiction aspect of it. But tell me, you're also an engineer, right? And I said, right. And he said, how much of that stuff could you actually build? And I said, I don't know. And he said, I'd like to give you a million dollars just to see what happens. And that ended up with me founding a startup that, that you know, ate up 10 years of my life uh, and uh, really, really altered the trajectory of my life. Um, and it was all from a, from a science fiction idea. So you never know. You know, that's awesome okay. though. Yeah, I do remember back in the day when everyone was convinced that national security was going to be compromised because one of our presidents was using a BlackBerry. I don't know if you remember that about Obama way back when. Yes, I do. Um, it, it was I mostly the old Facebook fogey shaking. was much more dangerous, honestly. But it, what it really came down to was he was the what, probably one of the younger politicians at the time. This was during his first campaign, if you remember. And all the old fogies were like, no, none of that newfangled tech. It was a bunch of finger wagon. It, it was pretty funny to watch from the outside. And that's not even on oh, the politics oh. of it, because I, I just remember that the sky was falling because he had a BlackBerry. Blackberries are still favored uh, over other smart devices in government service because they're more easily secured. Um, that's so how they do that. I just remember there you because go. we found something JR honestly didn't know. Well, I, I was aware of the, the Blackberry stuff because when I got the, the traumatic brain injury clinic gives out, well, they used to give out Blackberries because it was um, adaptive technology. So it lets you like have the calendar feature, the phone book, all the things that people have trouble forgetting that we take, uh, we kind of take for granted now because every smartphone has them. I mean, hell, a flip phone can do most of that now. But at the time, that was like life altering. And the VA was giving some people Blackberries and some people the iPod Touch back in the day. And I happened to get the the one that got the touch, but they had done all the training for me on the Blackberry because that was what they thought we they were going to be giving us at yeah. Walter Reed. It was kind of funny. So it stuck. Every time I think Blackberry, I think about that. So anyway, 
weird what technology can do. So and all of that sounds fascinating, but today we brought you here to talk about Rich Man Sky. So where did the premise for that particular story come from? How did you come up with the idea? Well, I mean, the, the, the basic idea is just uh, uh, what happens when the space program is dominated by high net worth individuals doing whatever they want. Uh, and that's not an idea you have to look very, very far to, to, to have. Uh, you know, it's happening all around us right now. So my only question there was, what does it look like 30 years from now? Um, as for the, the details of, of the, the, the world building and the, and the, and the story, um, you know, world building is a, is a fine art, especially in hard science fiction. One of the mistakes that, that science fiction often makes is to take sort of one trend line and extrapolate it into the future and keep everything else the same. And the results often wind up looking absurd, uh, even just a few years later. Um, so the trick is to extrapolate lots of different trend lines together and see how they interact with each other. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that became pretty evident to me is that America is going to continue to fight wars. Uh, we're going to continue to have, uh, you know, a, a government that, that likes to have its hand in, in things around the world. But at the same time, as you get more and more stuff happening in outer space, you start to get this strange effect that you have uh, trillionaires. I mean, again, if you, if you roll it out 30 years in the future, it doesn't take a big imagination to say that there will definitely be trillionaires, not very many, but there will be. Uh, and we probably know their names right now. Um, but anyway, these trillionaires will have access to resources and infrastructure uh, that are outside the, the reach of earthly law. Um, and on the one hand, that's cool and it's fascinating and it lets you get stuff done without any red tape and it's really cool. But on the other hand, it has the potential to really freak out uh, governments. And so the particular jumping off point for the story is that you have a structure that's being built at the Earth's Sun, uh, uh, Lagrange Point One, so directly between the Earth and the Sun. Um, a large uh, solar collector is being built that gets a little larger and a little larger and a little larger every year um, to the point where you can look up at the sky with, with dark glasses on and you can see a little dot in the middle of the sun and it's getting large enough that it can uh, affect the Earth's climate in measurable ways. And that's a lot of power to have in the hands of one individual. Um, and so what does, the, what does the US government do when faced with a, uh, a potential national security threat on that scale? And the answer is some kind of military intervention, but they want it to be deniable. So what they really wanna do is infiltrate, uh, which is another thing that that uh, governments are, are good at doing and like to do. So that's that's the jumping off point. Who is Who infiltrates? How do they infiltrate? Why do they infiltrate? Um, and so that that's kind of the the main thread of the story uh, is this uh, uh, particular Air Force medic who uh, has retired from the Air Force, uh, but is actually uh, secretly still in service. She's applied to be an astronaut and has been accepted into this private space program. Um, and the story is kind of what happens to her. And uh, it's in the nature of situations like this that they never go as planned. And oftentimes when things don't go as planned, nearly everyone involved is out of their depth. And those are the stories that I think are the, are the most interesting where you have people that are just kind of coping moment to moment uh, in order to uh, in some cases, just simply survive, but also in order to try to produce some outcome that's favorable uh, to, to themselves or, or their interests or, or their bosses or, or what have you. And the other thing that makes it more complicated than that is that that's not the only structure that's being built uh, 
in outer space. That's not the only trillionaire who has an agenda that's at odds with uh, with what the governments of the Earth might like. And so there's a lot of intrigue going on between the trillionaires and between the trillionaires and and governments. Uh, so it has it's a it's a military thriller in some ways. It's a spy thriller in other ways. It's a bit of an adventure story, as most things in outer space should be. Um, uh, so it's got a lot of different uh, different uh, elements uh, going on there. And if you look at the cover, it, there's also this kind of erotic thread running through it. Um, and that's also not an accident. If you talk to anybody who's been in Antarctica. Uh, uh, there's the cover. Yeah. <laughs> cover by Dave Seeley. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that sort of uh, the the cover on the hardcover that that paperback cover is a very brightened version of the actual painting. The actual painting is much darker. So you have this this image that's at once erotic and, and vaguely sinister. Um, and that's kind of capturing the spirit of the story. Um, you have women who are being recruited as space colonists and they're being put into hibernation and shipped out to L1. Uh, and some of them are not who they, who they appear to be or, or what they appear to be. Um, but the whole situation is kind of creepy uh, sort of all the way around. Uh, and so behind all the action and behind all the, you know, uh, the sex and the, and the shooting and stuff like that, there is this, sort of creepy thread of who's really in charge here, um, who gets to decide what's going to happen. Okay, so I got a quick question before we dive into to the commercial break and then start diving into the story even deeper. So you mentioned that this is, you know, your, your take on a hard sci-fi story. Do you think there's a point where you can go too far in the future for a story to be considered hard science fiction? Because I mean, this sounds sort of near future. It is. It's. It's. I don't normally play this. This. Uh, at least at novel length, I don't. I don't often play this. This close to the, the present day, and it. It comes fraught with with uh, perils because it. You know, stories like that can become obsolete pretty quickly, uh, if you're not careful. But no, I think the question of whether something is hard science fiction or not, um, it comes down to. It's like pornography. You know it when you see it. Um, if your intent is pornographic, that that comes across very clearly. If your intent is criminal, that comes across very clearly. Um, and I think that that hard science fiction similarly is a matter of intent. Even if you're departing substantially from from known physics, if you're doing it in a hard science fictiony kind of way, then there are rules to that game. There are rules to how you extrapolate from the known. Um, it doesn't just do whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, even the magical technologies of the far future have to obey the laws of thermodynamics. Or if they don't obey the laws of thermodynamics, if they're stealing energy out of the vacuum, then that has constraints also. Um, so, so no, I, I, I don't think that, that uh, hard science fiction is limited to, to the near future. Okay. Because it's it's always interesting to see some people call their stuff hard science fiction, and I'm like, that sounds just as hand wavy as what I write. <laughs> and, and I make no uh, no mistakes that I, I barely made it through college science. So I was just curious what you what you thought on the issue. So is it just the extrapolation that makes it hard science for you, or is there something more concrete, or is it is it too nebulous to say? Well, I mean, I'll tell you, uh, my my last novel was called Antediluvian, and it was sort of a time travel novel uh, that involved extracting memories that are stored in the sort of quantum haze surrounding the Y chromosome. Uh, this is information that's, uh, you know, handed down intact from generation to generation and can be accessed with quantum computers. And that's a completely bug fuck absurd concept. Uh, I, I just made it up, but the way to sort of paper over that is to have very realistic details about quantum computing and very realistic details about 
uh, Y chromosome genetics uh, and epigenetics and, and things like that. And then uh, this part that's absurd, you just, it, it becomes this very small step. You, you're talking about this over here and you're talking about this over here and you just lightly step over the, the, the part that, that is absurd. And I'll tell you, a lot of people didn't notice at all. A lot of people said, oh, the science is very realistic. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> so so when you look back, and we're going to definitely have to have you back. We've been man meaning to do a uh, hard sci-fi fireside chat sort of panel. Um, it's just lining everybody up is sometimes difficult. But so like some of the stuff that would have been considered hard science fiction back in the day that just they proved to be wrong about things. Would you still consider that hard science, even if they ended up being wrong? So like, for instance, some of what Heinlein wrote in Starship Troopers with the, in the book, the way he described their suits, like that's not too different than mechanics work today. But of course, everything was nuclear powered because he wrote it in the 50s. Um, would you consider those kind of older works? And I'm just using that as an example, um, that the science ended up not playing out how they thought, but they followed as they understood it. Would you still consider that hard sci-fi looking back? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. A lot of hard science fiction starts from an, one a single outrageous premise, um, and then kind of extrapolates uh, uh, realistically from there. And if you want to put your outrageous premise in the past, if you want to say, "Well, this is how we thought it it worked," um, you can even today you can uh, you know write a whole novel around the wrong science of the past. There have been a number of interesting examples of that. Uh, I think Celestial Bodies by Richard Garfinkel uh, uh, kind of hit hit that note uh, pretty well. Um, so no, I, I don't see any obstacle there. Okay. All right. So this is the moment, uh, dear listener, now that I've um, scratched the itch of all those questions I had. Uh, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man. Space, a tycoon's playground. From a monastery on the moon to a solar shade large enough to cool the earth, the dreams of a handful of trillionaires dictate the future of humanity. Outside the reach of earthly law, the four horsemen do exactly as they please. Earth is not amused, and an international team is sent to neutralize the most dangerous project in human history. But nothing is quite that simple when rich men control the sky. Rich Man's Sky by Will McCarthy and BaneBooks.com. All right. Well, thank you for, for sponsoring the episode. Time that uh, that lining for a pairing up very well. Um, but before we dig in, can we take a moment? And I'm going to put this. The I'm going to say that was such a gritty voice. It was awesome. I hope I was that going for the audio book. You know, um, I haven't listened to the audio book. Uh, it, back in the old days, the audiobook would come on CDs and they would send me a copy. These days it's all downloadable and they don't they don't email me a copy of the of the uh, the MP3s or MP4s or whatever they are. So I haven't actually heard it. Okay, well we'll, we'll have to talk to uh, to the PR people over at Bain for you. But all right, I'm gonna make that whole screen. We're gonna zoom in to some of the details. So what's the story of this cover? How did you come up with the um, this as the image you used? Oh, I didn't come up with it at all. Um, this is uh, a, a painting by a guy named Dave Seeley. And there are a few cover arts, uh, cover artists. Um, uh, one of them is Rick Berry, uh, who, who did some covers for me. Absolutely fabulous. Um, Dave Seeley, as, as it happens, is, is close friends with Rick Berry and they actually share a studio. So they seem to have some of the same DNA. Um, really good cover artist will read the book cover to cover and think hard about it and then decide what's the most evocative image that they can pull out of that story. What's the, what's the image that's going to be the most like visually selling of the, of the whole idea. Uh, so this is Dave Seeley's image. This is not mine. Um, and so it's, if you, it, go ahead, go ahead. I was just say the one thing I really liked is, is if you can if you get the high res image that they have on the Bain website, and you can zoom in, just ignore the girls in the foreground. Just look at the details that's in the spaceship behind them. I was trying to uh, zoom into those parts without m making it seem like something else. So I'm going to need you, dear listener, to be grown ups for five seconds. But the, just the details in the spaceship around them are, are compelling. It adds depth to the image. And this is you know you were talking about how uh, when when a uh, an artist has the same 
image that 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 you have this uh the only the only artistic license that that dave seeley took here is that um these women are actually strapped to the wall they're velcroed to the wall to keep them from floating around because they're in suspended animation uh and they're not in the cockpit of the spaceship they're in a compartment behind the cockpit so that's the only artistic license that's been uh, uh taken here but the uh, image is otherwise a literal snapshot from from about the middle of the book, and everything that that uh, uh, Dave painted here is pretty much exactly as I as I envisioned it. Now, is that available since it's a painting as well? If your readers like it so much, can they buy this as a print? I don't know. Uh, Dave Seeley has a website; you could check it out. All right, I'll, I'll get his information. We'll throw that in the show notes, dear listener. All right, Doc, next one's on you. So this is part of a series, right? It is the start of a series, yes. Okay, um, so the sequel is called Poor Man's Sky, and it will be out wow. in January. It's done, and I've seen the cover art for that one also. It's also by Dave Seeley. It's also fantastic. Um, and then the uh, third book is called Beggar's Sky, and I'm working on that one now. And like all novels in progress, it's behind schedule, but I'll get there. Um, and then um, that completes the uh, uh, this sort of particular trilogy. But the the setting is a is a rich one that I think I will probably continue to mine for some time. That is, I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm gonna definitely pick this up and read it. Which tropes do you feel Rich Man's Sky hits the kind of the best? And the and the tropes of science fiction. You know that might not be for me to say. Um, uh, one of the things it it's a it's a nominee right now for the Prometheus Award, and one of the things that the Prometheus Award judges said is that um, the book has so many different points of view. Uh, and that was kind of what they really liked about it. It's not really a libertarian novel per se. There are libertarian uh, ideas in it. Uh, but there are also other kinds of ideas. There, there are, you know, brutal it, oligarchic ideas. Uh, it feels like it falls in the tradition of, you know, um, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, in a way. I was thinking that too, actually. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, uh, certainly the the Prometheus judges similarly said it was it was Heinlein esque, and I think it is. I think you know. Inevitably, we're all we're all influenced by the stuff we read when we were younger. But hopefully, I like to think that there's more to it than that. I like to think that there's a a, a richness that that I bring to it that that's mine and not Heinlein's. Oh, there's definitely I think some of that just from what you were telling. It definitely while the the tropes of like the big business talking about how we're going to explore space, how that also affects interpersonal dynamics. Um, is definitely Heinlein-esque. You definitely have your own spin on how you're doing it and how, why, like what has caused this motivation. I don't think Heinlein ever wrote anything where it was, I mean, yes, the guy in Stranger in a Strange Land did have lots and lots of money at one point, but I don't think he really thought much about the economic aspect of hereditary wealth and trillionaires like you're doing with this. So. Yeah, and you know, in a in a story like the man who sold the moon, uh, the there's this uh, kind of undercurrent of approval. Like it's good, it's good that that private industry is is getting involved, and it's good that that the moon is being sold, uh, even if it's kind of sold on lies. It's still it's it's getting the job done, and 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 that's all that's all to the good. And I had that in here too. I think it's great that we have private industry accomplishing things that that governments are not able to, and so part of me is that that cheerleader rah rah, but another part of me is well, you know, it's not really great when power is that concentrated. It can be too much of one thing for sure. So there has to be a, a balance between the two. Since yours is. Since your story is near future, do you address the uh, Elon Musk's uh, roadster that was left floating in space? I'd love to see that come into play in a science fiction, you know, near future story. 
Like it crashes. I, 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 I don't know. I do not. I do not address anything to do with any actual space entrepreneurs who are alive today. Probably smart lawsuits are a thing. I just would. It'd be hilarious if that if that ever becomes a plot point later, because you know, objects in motion stay in motion and all that. Anyway, I don't know why that amuses me, but when I think hard sci-fi, I was going through all the stuff I remembered on the in the field, which admittedly, Doc, isn't much, but you shut your mouth. It's okay. It's really adorable when you try. It's like watching a child bring you this amazing piece of artwork. You have to value it for what it is and the effort put behind it. <laughs> uh, I don't know why people listen to us, Doc. Keep going. So, um, but what subgenres do you feel this fits into really the best? Subgenre is tricky. Um, I think that there's always a, a desire to pigeonhole things. But I also think that there are very few uh, works of even even very commercial art that that actually pigeonhole all that cleanly. Um, you know, the best military science fiction has a lot more going on than than just guns. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is the best of anything. That's that's not for me to decide. But um, I think that it's got elements of military science fiction. Uh, it's got elements of of kind of uh, Cold War intrigue, uh, and it's got elements of of uh, you know just kind of raw balls out uh, you know adventure with uh, uh, you know men and women kind of getting to exciting places. Uh, that's that's really all I, I think I, I can say about it. Um, I don't I don't think there is a subgenre that fits this book, and I frankly don't think there's a subgenre that fits most books. I don't think any one book ever fits into one subgenre, unless you're talking game uh, like lit RPG, because but that is because it is so specific in that case. But um, I think it's a great book. Can you tell us more about the main character in this book, though? Uh, yes. The, the main character is named Alice Kyung, and she is uh, an Air Force pararescueman. Um, and this is actually the most elite unit uh, in the U.S. military, at least right now. And you don't hear very much about it. Um, but the job of the pararescueman is to airdrop behind enemy lines and save and evacuate the wounded. Um, and uh, so it's it's terribly dangerous and it's terribly demanding. They have to be uh, uh, fully qualified, at least paramedics. They have to be at least as qualified as as you know uh, air ambulance crew uh, in in civilian life. Um, but they also have to be fully qualified special forces operatives. They have to know how to how to halo jump and they have to know how to shoot and they have to know how to you know, land and water and, and all kinds of stuff like that. So you don't hear very much about them, but they're there in every military conflict. They're there. If anyone ever gets, gets wounded and has to be evacuated, they're the ones who are doing it. Um, and so it really grabbed me that um, that person, a person with that background would be very highly uh, desirable as an astronaut. That's somebody that that private industry would snap up in a heartbeat uh, if uh, if she presented herself as a as a potential colonist because she's got a lot of different skill sets that would be extremely useful in space uh, and so she is uh, uh, retired from from the Air Force and trained in secret uh, in the in the art of uh, of zero gravity hand to hand combat which is called ZDO. And it's developed by the by the U.S. Space Force. Um, she's trained in secret uh, at a at a space hotel, which is delayed from opening for exactly that purpose, under very high secrecy. Uh, and then she is shipped off. Uh, she's she's put in in suspended animation and and shipped off to to the to the space colony. But that's just the start. That's the start of the of the story. Um, so uh, a lot of things, a lot of things start going wrong very early. 
So, so how do you handle the suspended animation? Do you just say that it happens and move on? Do you dive into the concepts of like cryogenics and all of that? Uh, actually, I get I get really you talk about your peer reviewed science. I got really into the nitty gritty of this, and I try not to belabor it. You know, as a as a younger writer, I loved belaboring things and beating my readers over the head with my research, but that doesn't tend to go over all that well. People skip over those parts if you if you get too detailed. But um, uh, what I had in the story, and this is based rigorously on on uh, on the science, there are three different kinds of hibernation in in uh, in Rich Man's Sky. One of them is called squirrel hibernation, and it's the lowest, uh, it's the shallowest level of of hibernation. The next deeper level is bear hibernation, uh, where people are are much more deeply under and much more difficult to rouse. Uh, and then the uh, highest level of hibernation is where people are not quite frozen. They're, they're uh, vitrified. They're, they're pumped with, with antifreeze and, and put in a vitrified state. And I don't want to say too much, but uh, uh, it turns out interesting things happen to the brain uh, during that process. Um, does the body um, age in your your take on these, or is that something um, like do you address that at all? Because in some in some franchises they'll they'll speculate that the body stops aging because it's frozen. Others, it's just you know like a long coma, but the body is still doing its thing. Uh, the in in uh, even in just light squirrel hibernation, uh, aging is slowed down just because metabolism is slowed down. Really, the only mechanism of aging is is sort of cosmic rays uh, uh, and and radiation damage. Um, okay. But um, in in this particular case, the the people are only in hibernation for a month. It, it's a slow boat out to L one, um, and you you it's just much much cheaper and much easier. There's much less demands on a spacecraft if. Uh, if all but the, the the pilots are are in hibernation, less mouths to feed. That makes sense. So you talked about the main character. Were there any secondary characters that were especially especially memorable for you? Uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of characters in the story. Um, but the one that I that I enjoy the most uh, is one of the one of the trillionaires, one of the four horsemen. He's a, a Russian oligarch named Grigory Orlov, and he's just basically pure evil, uh, uh, which is fun. I mean, it's I don't have a lot of straight up villains uh, in in my stories, but when I do, I, I enjoy them. Um, and most villains don't consider themselves to be villains. Most villains are ideologues of one sort or another. They're trying to bring their particular vision to fruition. Um, but Grigory Orlov just uh, knows how to make money. Uh, he's the son of a of a Russian oligarch, so he's grown up in this kind of mafioso uh, uh, business culture, and he just lives and breathes it. Uh, and there's a purity to that. Everyone else is kind of morally gray to one extent or another. Everyone else is sort of compromised to one extent or another. But but Grigory Orlov is not compromised compromised and does not compromise. Okay. That's, that's fair. Um, this has been out long enough that you've gotten some fan interaction. Have they surprised you with anybody they thought was more important than you intended them to be? Um, you know, people take, one of the things about art, uh, is that all art really becomes a Rorschach test. Um, and I think it's particularly true for, for, for some works more than others. And I would say that this work, the word that I had in mind when I was writing it was kaleidoscope. I want it to be a, a kaleidoscopic view of a future where there are a lot of things going on. Um, and I think that within that kaleidoscope, people pick out the parts that they agree with and they say, that's what the book is about. So some people say, this is a uh, this is a sexist book. Other people say it's a it's a woke book, or not necessarily that they agree with. Sometimes that they disagree with. It's been criticized as both too feminist and too uh, 
uh, sexist. It's been criticized as too woke, but also too hardcore pro capitalist uh, or, or pro military or or pro this or anti that. Um, and so it really I, I feel like almost everybody that I talk to has come away with something different uh, from the story. And that that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. Okay, so we were we'll get back to a second to talk about your characters. So you did a lot of horrible things to these poor characters, putting in this this uh, mess of a world. So if they met you in a back alley and they knew that you were the Will McCarthy who made their lives difficult, how do you think that reaction would play out? Would you would you survive? Yeah, I think I think most of them at the end of the day, um, uh, I think all of the people who go to space in this story are. Uh, for one reason or another, they're there because they want to be. Uh, they're there because they they share the dream and they share the vision. And it's people who fuck it up. Uh, but but the vision itself, the the dream, uh, is kind of driving everyone. Okay. All right, so this is the part where we ask you to give us a sneak peek at uh, behind the curtain. So, were there any cool scenes or ideas that you had to cut from this novel that that might be interesting to uh, people waiting for book two and three and four? Um, I think this is one that people are uh, they, they'll be waiting a long time for. Um, there was a there's a there's a secret chapter that I that I did cut out um, where the eroticism got really so out of hand that that it. Um, uh, detracted from the from the plot. Uh, Took away from the story. It right. I mean, the thing about about sex in in books and movies, etc. You know, the sort of the gold standard is sure as long as it's necessary for the for the to drive the story. Um, and this was a chapter that ultimately I I determined was not necessary to drive the story. It was just a, a diversion, but it was. It was uh, very NC-17. Okay. Um, so, all right. That'll be interesting for those type of readers. You can always hunt him down on the social medias, link to the show notes below, and maybe you can purchase the extra chapter in his Patreon or something. All right, Doc, you get to ask your, your favorite questions. Technology. Okay. So... This is definitely a world where the technology is a key part of it and a key part of the story. So what level of technology can we expect to see? I mean, we've talked about cryo freezing, but do we have faster than light travel? Like, give us a hint a little bit more. Uh, yeah, no, there's there's no faster than light travel. There's no faster than light communication. Um, uh, it's It's all very kind of near term, uh, you know, there's asteroid mining uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the probably the most far out thing that's that's happening is that the uh, ESL-1 uh, shade uh, is a giant solar collector and it produces so much electricity and there's, there's an antimatter production facility uh, that's that's cranking out antimatter in quantities that that has never been possible before, um, and that requires a speculative leap. I I just sort of proposed that that there was a uh, a more efficient way of producing antimatter than the the one that we have right now, and that's that's about as speculative as it gets in this first volume. Okay. Okay. So, is there artificial gravity? No, there so, isn't even there isn't even spin spin gravity uh, at at this stage in development. Uh, it's still very kind of rough, wild west. Uh, there are drugs. I suppose this is another speculative element. There are drugs that do a good job of keeping the body, the the muscles and bones from from wasting away in zero gravity. And so, for the most part, people are not too worried about artificial gravity. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, you know, what, what tech of everything in here have you, that you've 
developed or created that you would want in today's world for you? Um, well, uh, the story opens um, uh, in uh, the, the Black Rock Desert of, of Nevada with a, uh, a habitat that has its two cargo containers, one that's outfitted as a home and the other one that's outfitted uh, as a kind of a life support system. Uh, uh, you know, poop and sunlight go in one end. It, it, it has photovoltaics and it also is able to draw moisture out of the atmosphere. Um, but it uh, has this kind of intensive grow operation that, that grows plants and, and, uh, and protein and things like that. Um, so uh, in theory, it, it provides for all the, all the needs of, uh, of one person or, or one small family. Um, and that's just kind of a, again, it's a jumping off point. It's just showing like, well, this is what we're doing on earth. That's sort of mimicking what's happening in space. And the versions in space are a lot more sophisticated because they have to be, but I would like to have something like that. I'd like to have a, a cargo container that, that produces <laughs> all my food. So how would you abuse that? That sounds like a very sensible choice. So of technology. How would I abuse it? Yeah. Just never go to the grocery store again? Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it would, I suppose that would, it would lend itself to that, to that sort of abuse. Like if you're a, if you're a hermit, if you uh, just, you know, like to stay isolated, uh, it would, it would certainly help you do that. <laughs> so did you follow um, when they did the dome experiment, I think it was out in Arizona where they had them live out there for a while. They've done some of it um, in some um, snowy climates as well, where they live in the, the domed environments to simulate uh, habitat living. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I followed Biosphere 2 very closely when it when that happened. That was by far the most rigorous uh, uh, test of its kind. And it it was a, a, at best a, a mixed success. Um but yeah, I've actually done some uh, Mars analog stuff myself. I, I was a, a crew member on a two week mission in, uh, in the desert in Utah. That was, that was very interesting. They, uh, they've got a, good, a couple of good books about that. I picked up at the uh, Hampton Air and Space Museum, but they also had the really crappy movie by Polly Shore, if you're in for a good comedy flick. Trapped about in the, the Biodome, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, does this, you know, well, because it's near future, I'm going to assume you don't have aliens in this world. Um, well, I think, uh, I'll, I'll be coy about that. I'm, I'm not going to answer right. that one. So we're going to ask you this one, this one more hypothetically then, and don't answer specifically about rich man's guy, just more broadly. When you go about creating, um, magical creatures, aliens and the like for your novels, how do you create them as a, as a creative person? Do you let nature inspire you? Um, do you let your nightmares, you just make it up completely from whole cloth? What is your strategy when, when making fictional beings? I don't think making it up completely is ever gonna produce a, a good result. Uh, I think if you're not drawing inspiration from nature, then you're not going to produce an authentic seeming result. Um, the question is what, what constitutes nature in any given context? Uh, so, you know, if you're if you're talking about creatures that come from an Earth-like planet, then they're likely to have uh, some of the same characteristics in common with with creatures on Earth. If you're talking about, I don't know, a gas giant or a, a molecular cloud uh, or the the surface of a of a neutron star, then you're going to have to uh, uh, sort of broaden your scope about what uh, what nature uh, it, you're, you're drawing from, but certainly I think you have to you have to pay very close attention to uh, to the laws of nature in in creating anything imaginary. Okay, that's fair. So uh, as this interview is clearly winding down, was there anything? about Rich Man Sky that we didn't ask you that you want to tell us before we move on? Hmm. 
you've been pretty thorough in your questioning. Um, uh, no, I think I think uh, you know I would just encourage anyone who's intrigued by what they've heard here or or by the by the uh, unnecessarily erotic cover art uh, to uh, to just read the book and make up their own minds. All right, that's fair. And uh, I mean, cover art is, if you remember it, it's kind of doing its job. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not complaining. And this is available in all the formats, paperback, hardcover, ebook, uh, CD format. You can get a copy in your hot little hands or you can download it from like Audible or any other um, digital readers. So it's available in all the formats, people. So, so go do the thing. Uh, but be, lest I forget... Um, it sounds like this is a book intended for adults. What would you say the age range is for this? Oh, you know, I was reading adult science fiction. I was reading uh, Heinlein, uh, Heinlein's adult novels when I was eight or nine. So I, I may be the wrong person to ask, but I don't think kids need to be protected from from the the big bad world. I think they they can set their own level. Okay, that's fair. All right. Now, this is the part of the uh, the wrap-up, dear listener, where I remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So do your part and keep the book-writing, book-reader ecosystem afloat, people. You know what happens if it gets unbalanced. I don't know, something bad, but we can't go political here, so I'll save my jokes. Because Doc will give me the mom look. And it just, and then she starts doing the knife hand, and it just gets uncomfortable for everybody. Oh, Jr., your life is uncomfortable. Fair, fair. All right. Well, before we let you go, can you tell listeners and readers, or listeners, listeners, readers, and viewers, how they can find you? Uh, well, I wouldn't actually recommend my website. It's it's uh it's in terrible shape. I haven't updated it in a long time. Um, so I I I've been. Uh, bad about social media generally. I was one of the first writers uh, to have a website at all. Um, I, I got in very early, uh, but I, I think in, to a certain extent that's crippling me now. Uh, my my webpage needs a complete and total overhaul that I've just been too lazy to give it. Um, so uh, I would say just check me out on, on Facebook or or just look me up on Amazon and, and, and read the books. All right. And you can find us at dear listener over on the Twitters at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast again backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast and you can find our website over at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades again anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month you can help keep the lights on and finally you can support the show over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr handley again buymeacoffee.com backslash author jr handley be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast and i promise i will keep doc seska and nick garber uh duly buried in books that they will never have time to read but they still must collect because you must have them all all of you them. know me i do know you i want all the pokemon and all the books pokemon are too expensive i'm trying to keep it realistic here Fair, fair. But I like the books. So, <laughs> All right, bring it home. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For the absentee Nick Garber, the Adelbrand J.R. Hanley, I'm Seska. This was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week, same times, indulging our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes. Of course, picking on J.R. And maybe he might have a voice by then. I don't know. We'll One see. Can't help.